Um, okay, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Christine Kirchhoff. Um, Christine did her PhD and postdoc at the University of Michigan before working as a professor for the past nine years at the University of Connecticut. Um, she actually just recently joined the faculty at Penn State. She has a joint appointmentship as the associate, as an associate professor and the associate director of the Law Policy and Engineering program, and also a um, associate professor of civil and environmental engineering. I think I got that all right. Um, so she actually just joined uh, Penn State starting this past fall and actually reached out to us about being our faculty advisor for the Science Policy Society since our previous advisor left Penn State. Um, so we're really excited to have Christine give our welcome address for our symposium, our first ever Science Policy Symposium. All right, so it's wonderful to be here uh, and have a chance to talk with all of you and to welcome you to this, as Angela said, the first uh, ever, but hopefully an annual Science Policy Symposium uh, hosted by the Science Policy Society here at Penn State. So it's, it's wonderful to see the kinds of uh, agenda that, that the science policy uh, students have been able to put together. It's really incredible and it's a testament to their uh, hard work and dedication and interest in this topic. <clears throat> How many of you, if by a show of hands, would consider yourselves kind of experts or really knowledgeable in science policy or policy for science? Just kind of a show of hands. So we have a few people in the audience. Okay. I wanted to ask because part of what I wanted to do today is sort of ground us in what we mean by science policy. So I'll spend a, a good part of the welcome helping to lay that foundation so that we're on the same page with this conversation, hopefully set you up for this, the day and to be able to engage uh, in the conversations and discussions of science policy topics. So. As Angela said, I'm pretty new to Penn State, started in August of this year. I reached out, as Angela said, uh, I was so excited that, to learn that there was a science policy society here at uh, Penn State that I, I reached out and I asked for information. Um, I had known um, Michael Mann, been, you know, run into him before, and he had been the faculty advisor before he left Penn State to go to the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Angela wrote back, um, thanking me for my interest and uh, asking if um, you know I was a student interested in joining the group. <laughs> if only I was able to join a group like that when I was a student. So um, I politely responded, "No, I was you know knew that Michael Mann had vacated the, this uh, honor of a faculty advisor for this group, and so I, I asked if, if uh, she would consider me you know for that role and." And thankfully, she did. So I'm really delighted to be uh, associated with this group. Uh, I, what I'd like to do with the time that I have to welcome you all is to briefly introduce this Science Policy Society so you have more under and a better understanding of what this group is and the opportunities to get involved, because this is one avenue, as Andy uh, mentioned in his remarks just before, you know, getting involved in student groups and, you know, all the avenues that and, and opportunities that come along with that is one way to kind of get your feet wet in this space. Briefly then introduce the lineup you have in front of you, all the interesting topics and speakers for the day. You have that agenda, so I won't spend uh, much time on this at all. And I'll spend the bulk of my time on the conceptual definitions. What do we mean for science for policy and policy for science? And of course, I should note that we could spend days on that topic. So this will really just be a very high level glossing uh, over of the definitions. And then finally, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on similar to what Andy did in his uh, remarks at the end is some of the pathways to getting involved in this space, learning um, more skills and, um, you know, figuring out if you want to do this, what exactly do you want to do and how can you get uh, going on that path? And then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, my own circuitous route 
uh, around and in science policy. So the Science Policy Society here at Penn State, their mission is to bridge the gap between technical and non-technical audiences. And they do this through three main avenues, through efforts around education. So there's self-study for uh, policy, science policy topics that are of interest to the group that they bring uh, forward in monthly meetings and discuss. There is outreach that they engage in through not just the local community, through the local library, uh, outreaching to K through 12 audiences, um, but also through their very popular Science on Tap uh, program. So where they bring in speakers to talk about a range of science policy related issues and topics and engage with the community uh, in really lively discussions. And then through advocacy. So science policy writing as was discussed uh, just before here, trips to DCs to talk with legislatures, uh, legislators uh, around science policy topics, workshops, et cetera. So really so many different opportunities to get involved and engaged and get your feet wet and start learning about these issues. If you're from engineering or from biology or from kinesiology or other uh, departments on campus, you can find a home in this group. Members are from across the campus. So you can find like-minded folks who are interested in this space, trying to make a difference and learn more in this group. And what I've been really impressed with, besides all the things I've already said, is that they're really go after funding so they can host things like this, they can host the travel to DC. Um, really remarkable, ambitious group of students who are really passionate about science policy and really passionate about trying to make a difference. So I wanted to highlight a few individuals who were working with me to help ground me in the, in the inviting me to the give the welcome and uh, shepherding other things uh, that I, have engaged with the group. So Angela, of course, um, Claire, Tara, and Karen, and a range of others. And I apologize if I've left anyone off uh, of this list. But if you see these individuals and you're interested in the Science Policy Society, don't hesitate to uh, bend their ears, find out more about it, send an email, uh, and get involved. All right. So. You already heard from Andy around science policy publishing. I think it's a great way to kick off the conversation, the symposium today, on how to write for a non-technical audience. It's an important skill, and it takes a lot of skill to do to do it well. After this welcome speech uh, or welcome remarks speech is a little lofty, um, you'll hear from Daniel and Edward around the Chips and Science Act and. Uh, Nathan for food policy related issues. And right before lunch, Holly will uh, take you on a journey of her path in science policy. So really delighted for, to have uh, Holly Nathan here as the keynote uh, speaker and hold off that hunger pain, pay attention uh, and stick around uh, to hear that. And then after lunch, when you're satiated and before you fall asleep and not off, re-energize yourself and pay attention because you're going to hear about local level science policy and climate policy to round out the afternoon. And then I do hear that there's drinks and the like um, happy hour later on. So ask us about that as well. All right. So here's what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about science policy. This is a science policy symposium after all. When we think about science policy, we really want to break it down into kind of two avenues. We've got on the one hand, science for policy, and then on the other, policy for science. So if we want to start with policy for science, this is really public policy around funding, governing matters of the scientific enterprise. It's funding the structure, the regulation, the overall support of the scientific community and scientific uh, enterprise. What do we mean by that exactly? So here's an example of one piece of that puzzle, science funding. This is federal funding of science. So our taxpayer dollars go to the federal government 
And you'd be surprised, maybe astonished at how little discretionary funding there really is uh, for all that those tax dollars that come into play into um, the federal coffers. But among that discretionary funding that is available, 2% of GDP roughly is spent on non-defense R&D, so basic applied uh, and development related research funding. And that has been pretty steady for decades, that 2%. And that funding goes to all sorts of science. Science, the National uh, Science Foundation for those PhD and master levels uh, programs here at Penn State might be familiar with that, or the US Department of Agriculture, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that does a lot of climate and weather related research, uh, and on and on and on. So that 2% that doesn't seem like a lot, but it creates an amazing amount of investment in the scientific enterprise. And it's decisions around how much money, of, how much of that discretionary funding that we have available gets spent on things like science and how do you apportion that 2% among different priorities. That's where the policy for science really comes into play. And one other thing to keep in mind is that when we talk about policy for science, most of the individuals that are involved in shaping policy for science don't have a background in science or in research, right? So they are making decisions about how we spend and invest taxpayer dollars in, in research and development without the benefit or grounding in other of their own uh, expertise in research. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important for you to think about playing a role in helping to shape that policy for science, to really give your expertise to those individuals that are trying to make these decisions, because there's a lot at stake in terms of the priorities. And you can see that as in the federal level and at the state level, as one administration moves out and another comes in, big priority shifts can happen and that can translate into different funding priorities for what research gets prioritized uh, or not. And you saw that, for example, around climate change research and the transition between the two administrations. Another um, point to make is that it's not just this Policy for science and science for policy, for that matter, is not just a province of the US. Of course, the first speaker was in the Netherlands. So the US spends about 2% of GDP on, uh, well, this is 3%. So this is uh, non defense and defense RD spending. You can see that we stack up relative to other countries, we're lower than some, bigger than others, as a percent of GDP. But when you look at gross overall spending, US. Uh, spends more than most other countries on R&D. But other countries are catching up, including countries like China who are investing heavily in R&D. So this has implications, of course, for the trajectory of economic development, technology, uh, technological innovation in countries, because a lot of the federal spending on R&D really translates into things like you know, advanced computing, uh, new, new technology like GPS, uh, global positioning systems, and, you know, you name it, a lot of advancements come out of this uh, federal funding of science. And so it's a race among, you know, globally among uh, countries to try to make these investments and propel themselves uh, forward. So again, thinking about, it's, we often think about policy for science narrowly construed, but it has very broad implications, um, not just for uh, national priorities, but also for uh, global geopolitical considerations. Moving on from policy for science around funding, we can also touch on briefly the structure of the scientific enterprise. And if you go back to World War II, about 1945, there was a debate 
and it was a it was a raging debate on whether or not science should be structured such that it was relatively unfettered from society writ large so scientists are able to do the science that they feel compelled to you know answer the important research questions with the assumption that the research that scientists did if left alone to their own devices would benefit society it was ultimately the social contract for science is has has become through this debate that we as taxpayers will fund your science and that science will benefit society. So that the other model that was being considered at the time was much less freedom for scientists to pursue their own science. So much greater oversight, greater um, uh, political intervention in terms of what science was done or what questions were being asked. And that was really set aside to go down the route of this more independent model that which resulted in the passage of legislation that founded the National Science Foundation, the national labs, et cetera, and really set us on this pathway where we continue to be today. We have organized science really independently of, um, or meant to be independently of uh, society or political processes. That has implications uh, for the way in which we continue to organize science and we continue to think about the societal benefit and the social contract for science and whether or not after five, six, seven decades of this model, we are truly achieving the goals that we set out to achieve back when we, when uh, President Truman signed us into law around World War II. So there certainly has been a lot of change since then. And in fact, it's not just the federal government that funds science. Corporations fund science. And goals for corporations funding R&D is, of course, to benefit the marketplace, not necessarily you know, and indirectly to benefit uh, society, but more directly to benefit shareholders. Universities are also playing a larger role in funding science. And so the dynamics of where the federal funding of science lies with other streams of science funding have definitely changed over time and continue to change. And so again, this is this kind of consideration is important for you all to take into account as you navigate your own paths and think about how. Do we want to see science policy, policy for science play out from now and into the future? And how can we shape that through our interactions? Thinking about our investments in science and the benefit and potential that they have for driving our national enterprise forward. So let's talk now about science for policy. And this is often what we think about when we think about science policy, is how our science, the science that we do, can be used and in inform policy and decision making. And there are a range of uh, policy making needs when you think about air and water quality, food security, food safety, uh, environmental protections writ large, national security considerations. All of those laws, regulations, and policies are naturally should be informed by science. Of course, science isn't the only thing that's driving those policies, but it's an important component. But beyond kind of the science for policy specifically, there's also a lot of science that is used in decision making. And we can think of examples like farming, the agriculture in general. What crops farmers plant, when they plant them, what amendments they use on those crops to facilitate productivity, to minimize the kinds of best management practices they use to minimize water uh, pollution and runoff, et cetera. All of those kinds of decisions are informed by 
research that we do, some of which is here at Penn State in the land grant um, institution designed around, you know, built originally for informing ag production. It's not just ag, it's things like water managers trying to figure out how much water they can expect in a given water year. Is it going to be a dry year or a wet year? If it's a dry year, how do they manage that, et cetera? It's about energy uh, companies trying to decide how to deploy, where to deploy, and how many uh, crew members to deploy in the events of, for example, the nor'easter that just was uh, hitting uh, Connecticut, where I used to be. So I'm still paying attention to the weather there. But those kinds of big storm events often knock out power. And, and so electric companies often position their uh, crew members strategically to anticipate those power outages and restore them quickly. But those decisions are informed by really sophisticated models, weather forecasts, uh, you know, the costs and benefits of deploying uh, individuals out uh, in the uh, utility distribution system, et cetera. And those are just the tip of the iceberg. So you can see science for policy runs the gamut. There's amazing potential for uh, research to inform policy making. But one thing to keep in mind is this old model and way of doing science, but the expectation that if scientists are free to do their own thing, that naturally what comes of that science will be useful for policy and decision making is a flawed concept. We call that model, the linear model. What we've learned over time is that we really must, in order for science, your science, to be useful to inform policy and decision making, we have to really understand what policy and decision makers need. What, what problems are they trying to address? How do they define those problems? We often think that we understand the problem or the problems that we want to address and we do our science that we find of interest and then learn later that, it, that the policy makers and decision makers have no interest or it's not really relevant to the kinds of decisions that they are actually making. So this requires much more close collaboration between researchers like you and decision makers that you're hoping, or policy makers that you're hoping to inform with your research. And I think this is a really stark departure from where we've been since the 1940s and 50s with our approach to science to today where you see increasing calls for convergence uh, research or community uh, oriented research etc. And that's really acknowledging this need and recognition that we have to do if our intent is for our research to be useful for science uh, policy and for decision making, that we need to do our research differently than we've done in the past. I wanted to wrap up with a few comments about where you can go to learn more about this kind of work to upskill in science policy. And Andy mentioned the federal uh, and state policy fellowships. So he, he mentioned specifically the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, there are professional associations like HU that uh, fund uh, science fellowships that mentioned the National Academies as well. He also mentioned the California, so the state level programs in Connecticut, there's a new uh, science policy fellowship with the Connecticut uh, Academy of Sciences. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's many other uh, state level and federal oriented fellowships out there. And it's really designed to give recent graduates you know, a path into federal or state agency science policy work. And Holly will, will uh, mention some, some exciting news around the state policy fellowships. Another avenue is nonprofits, think tanks, philanthropy, applied research. Andy mentioned thinking about postdocs. I think that's a really important uh, avenue. 
In particular, I've sent a number of my students to um, the US EPAs through the Arise Research uh, Fellowships. Those are those can be targeted uh, masters or PhD level uh, students and really gives you an opportunity to do really policy relevant research that in this case, the EPA wants to inform particular policy actions or considering. So there you get you know, your foothold into both the science that's informing the policy and how the policy uh, making uh, process or regulatory uh, process works. Places like Brookings and other think tanks do, you know, are interested in um, producing, you know, important policy white papers. There's uh, Environmental Defense Fund, World Wildlife Fund, and others that are not working in the nonprofit space really around advocacy issues. So that's of interest, and that's a, uh, a path. And something that I've learned more recently are the uh, philanthropics like the Pew Charitable Trust, they do really important work around uh, education policy as just one example, climate uh, policy as well. And there are a number of different foundations that um, where you could become, you could work either with an embed within the foundation or have research funded by the foundation and uh, really help to energize and improve um, science policy in those different uh, topics of interest to those, those philanthropies. The Pew, uh, just, and some of the other foundations that work in this space are also very interested in understanding how to improve this work, um, which is, so they're kind of thinking about the science of the science, and uh, it's really interesting stuff that they're doing. So I encourage you to look at that. There's also private sector, Avenue, so don't forget that you could work at Google or uh, at an engineering firm or you know other type of consulting firm and do policy relevant work within those spaces uh, or for professional associations. You could also work in the development space. I had a friend of mine at Michigan who went to work for the World Bank, loves it, and um, you know really does policy oriented work around water. And then the last. To mention our certificates, degrees, internships, volunteering, students, professional groups, etc. All of these things, like involving yourselves with the Science Policy Society, really gives you a foothold in this. And just briefly to wrap up my own path, I graduated uh, with an engineering degree, went to work for an engineering firm, uh, AECOM. There, got interested in in that. So at the time, I was doing. Uh, working to design water and wastewater treatment plants, working on the uh, water plan for the state of Texas. And I got interested in what the heck, you know, state regulatory policy drives the designs for water and wastewater treatment plants and why they emphasize some things and not others. For example, there was no mention of sustainability or climate uh, resilience in the design standards for water and wastewater systems at the time. So I got more interested in science policy work, found that as an engineer, I wasn't taken seriously in the policy space. I don't know if anyone has run into that uh, as well, but you sort of are, people look at you um, as one thing or another. I decided to pursue a PhD. So that was an extreme decision. I don't pursue a PhD lightly. Uh, it's, it's a long haul, but it is an avenue. I ended up at Michigan where they have a, a certificate in science, technology, and public policy that's offered through the Ford School there. And um, my PhD dissertation was on integrating science and policy, looking at climate change assessments and water management. And that work really set the stage, which ended up being a focus on my own research and in the academic uh, world on policy and decision relevant research and studying that the science of knowledge use and this shift for uh, thinking more about collaborating with policy and decision makers, makers in order to help increase the likelihood that the research that we do is more decision relevant. So 
I hope that's helped to set the stage for science policy today. I encourage you to pay attention to, again, bend the ear of the Science Policy Society folks that you see around or others. Um, I'm happy to uh, talk with you about your interest in science policy if you want to learn more uh, or follow up after this. But enjoy the symposium. Welcome. And thanks so much, Angela.